1977 was an annus mirabilis for Great Britain. Queen Elizabeth II toured the country in celebration of her silver jubilee, as Britons quite literally danced in the streets. At Wimbledon, the centenary All England Championships were graced by the presence of Her Majesty, and for once, the tennis gods shone on the home nation. Virginia Wade was an elegant all-court player with talent to spare, but a fragile nerve. That year, I mean, I was coming obviously to the end of what was really my peak years, and I was thinking, you know, I've really messed up so many times at Wimbledon, and the extra aura that it had with the Queen being there and being the centenary year just managed to take my motivation, to make it stronger than my, the nerves. She's done it, she's done it. A fairy story come true. If I watch it now, or if I even talk about it, I might start getting emotional. There was a queen, and there was so much noise going on, I have no idea what she said. I mean, I just couldn't hear her. And then you hold the trophy up, and it's very heavy, by the way. I thought I've never experienced anything like this. And to tell you the truth, it made me feel very, very small, which was very nice. I mean, I just was part of the whole thing. A fairy story indeed, but a far cry from the preceding decades when British successes at Wimbledon were few and far between. In the second of our four-part series, we examine an era of huge change, not just at Wimbledon, but on a global scale. In the immediate post-war years, Britain was anxious to get back to normal, yet acutely aware of the difficulty of doing so. The land fit for heroes was still subject to rationing, and there were major shortages of staple foods. The centre court, a metaphor for the country, was gouged by a bomb crater. But the main aim was to get the show back on the road. There was no better symbol of a world at peace than a sunny afternoon at SW19. Americans would stop off in Ireland on the way here, and Shannon, would, the, the plane would stop, and would pick up butter and cheese and whatever, you know, we could have, because they just didn't have those things here at the time. All of London was very grim still in 1946. We hadn't really yet got over the war. Food was rationed. Um, some of the American players even brought their own steaks with them, I seem to remember. I took a, a, enough meat to have two steaks uh, every day for the 14 days, including about four days uh, during the Queen's tournament, which I played in the doubles. And it worked out beautifully. I was mentally prepared. I said, boy, I'm going to have no problems because I'm going to have my regular stuff in there. And it just worked out beautifully. That meat was a big help mentally for me. I, Hate to admit it, but I guess I was a little uh, steak freak in those days. It's part of the British nature to be generous with their sport. Invent the game, lay down the rules, export it, and then watch as the rest of the world becomes the masters. Beating the mother country became terrific sport after the Second World War, and where better to advertise the uprising than on the lawns of the most English of sporting events. Because the Americans hadn't had a war. They, their own championship 
in America was played throughout the war years. Uh, they didn't have any breaks, and so they went on playing and came here best prepared of all the competitors who played in 1946 and the, those next few years. So we had some very great American champions. I played a lot of matches against Don Budge when he was in the Air Force and I was in the Coast Guard, so we sort of kept sharp, and we were lucky in America being athletes that this, this was available to us. There were some great American stars of that uh, era. Uh, Bob Falkenberg, who used to chuck sets <laughs> because uh, he would get tired and conserve his energy by conceding a set. Rather a curious thing to th think of now, but that, that's what happened. Jack Kramer, of course. I'll be very honest with you. I'm fairly lucky uh, in winning my two US championships and my Wimbledon title. Anybody that wins Wimbledon is a deserving champion. When you win Wimbledon, you win because on that fortnight, you've been the best player in the world. Luck or not, the American men claimed five consecutive singles titles between 1947 and 1951. But their dominance was eclipsed by that of their female counterparts. You could name 12, 13, 14 really great American women, the greatest of whom, of course, was uh, Maureen Connolly, the first woman to win the Grand Slam in 1953. But even before her, we'd had Pauline Betts and Louise Bruff. I mean, the list goes on and on, but they were terrific players and uh, set a very high standard. In that outstanding generation, Maureen Connolly was the most talented, Louise Bruff the most effective, but Althea Gibson was the most surprising. Long before the Williams sisters' explosion onto the global stage came the girl from Harlem. Six foot tall and with a touch of both Venus and Serena in her imposing presence on court. She was intimidating. Um, she was tall, I don't know how tall, probably six foot two or so. And uh, she, she, she sort of towered over you. She was long and spindly and this great powerful, she threw the ball up miles high and this great powerful serve came belting down. She beat me often. In analyzing her game, she had a, a great serve, a very good serve. And she had continental strokes, which were, to me, it was always kind of baffling, you know. I, I didn't think they were solid, but she was making all these shots. <laughs> <laughs> Althea Gibson's vic victories in tennis were as important to people as Jackie Robinson's integration of baseball. At the time, she started playing be actually before the Civil Rights Movement and during the Civil Rights Movement. And particularly at that time, a lot of people placed a lot of stock in what entertainers and athletes were doing because they were on the national and international stage and they had such visibility that people held them in high esteem. There were a number of high-profile people like Sugar Ray Robinson and um, the boxer Joe Lewis who helped Althea. They helped provide her with money so that she could compete. They also broke barriers in their respective fields in bo boxing, so they understood what she was going through. The esteem of winning at such an international place as Wimbledon made Althea a huge star and an important figurehead for black people in sport and in life. People lined up outside of her apartment building in Harlem. People met her at the airport. She was surprised to see how many people were standing there to greet her. People had celebrations everywhere that she went, and people, you know, continued to celebrate for years, and they hold her in high esteem today, and she paved the way for a number of people, from Arthur Ashe to Venus and Serena Williams. Wimbledon had evolved into the premier global tennis tournament, and demand was increasing for show court tickets. But the All England Club's unique entrance policy remained unchanged. It was the same in the 1950s and 1960s as it is today. If you want to see the 100 yards run in under 10 seconds, then stand by the Wimbledon gates on the last day. I think our approach to ticketing is, is very egalitarian. I, d I don't think there's many sporting events in the world who have a public ballot uh, for tickets open to anybody to apply and then deliberately holds back uh, ground passes and a limited number of centre court tickets for people to queue up. I mean, you know, last few years we had 20,000 people queuing in Wimbledon Park for 6,000 ground passes and, and 500 centre court tickets. I think Wimbledon's always tried to uh, dedicate its efforts very much to the fans. Uh, that is the purpose of really the queue at Wimbledon. Wimbledon could very easily just sell all, all the centre court tickets in a couple of days to whoever the highest bidders would be from corporate companies, but um, the queue is the fairest way of getting six or 7,000 people a day into our grounds. 
I think it's become a rite of passage almost. You know, now we've moved it into the park, it's, it's become, and again, for international people, I mean, if you go in the queue, you know, I think if you're from Australia or South Africa and you're in London, it's, you know, you do a couple of days in the queue because it's a nice, so we provide a nice environment, but again, they all add to the vibrancy, I think, of the atmosphere for people who come in here. What we've now seen is, is almost like an emergent strategy, which is the queues are actually an important part of the fan experience. It's, it's part of the product, it's part of the brand. And so rather than seeking to alleviate the queues, it's almost as though the, the, the All England Club have, have tried to perpetuate the queues because it's all part of the, uh, the camaraderie, it's part of the, uh, the communal spirit, it's, it's part of um, the, the event itself. So I think in, in, in some ways it, it was entirely accidental, but what Wimbledon are now doing is playing this out very, very well because they, they've used the misfortune in a way that's actually helped to create a very interesting brand, in, brand experience. After the American dominance in the post-war years, a new nation emerged as a force to be reckoned with. The first country to view tennis as a team sport. The Australians roomed together, practiced together and drank together. They call it mateship, an unbreakable camaraderie which still lies at the heart of Australian sporting success. Well, I think the Australian group, which was started by uh, Sedgman McGregor, uh, owed a great deal to Harry Hopman, the, the great coach and former player, uh, who moulded those players into a great Davis Cup squad. Well, Harry was, you know, he was really uh, a very strong person. Couldn't teach you how to hit a ball that well, but he was a stickler for fitness. And, uh, and I think his teams won so many matches because they could go all day and they were the fittest players. And he was very strict, you know, like uh, I can remember our first trip away when, when the Rose, Will and Hodes first trip away when they were 17. And I was um, about uh, 21 or something. And he had, had us going to bed at 10 o'clock at night and I wasn't used to going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, but we, you know, you had to get into bed at 10 o'clock light and turn the light out. If you didn't do what he said, he'd say, right, oh, you'll be on the next plane back to Australia. Well, you know, you, you've got to take it back in, in its context because it was amateur tennis. So amateur tennis really didn't mean that you were playing for prize money, you were playing for pride and, you know, and trophies. And it was, it was really your opportunity to represent your nation. The Australians' domination of the game coincided with the first mass push towards professionalism. But this wasn't a new idea. Big Bill Tilden had blazed a trail as early as the 1930s. Tilden, as he advanced and got into his 30s, realized that he could, he could make a buck off of this. And so he began to tour. Tilden gave older players an avenue to go into and they all succeeded him. You became a champion, then you turned pro and you had to leave the big tournaments. I won at Wimbledon and I won the US and then won Davis Cup. And then in, the opportunity opened up for me to turn professional and make a career out of being a top tennis player. Got a telephone call in New York during the US Open, I think 1967, to wonder whether I was um, ready to sign a contract to play professional tennis. And at that point, I was ready to give up and, and uh, retire from tennis and get a real job. But uh, I was offered $30,000, which was four times what I could have made in any job back in South Africa at the time. And um, so I signed, quickly. The divide was absolute. By turning pro and accepting payment for playing the sport, you were excluded from all of the Grand Slams, including Wimbledon. By the 1960s, the amateur game was in turmoil. The top players had all been poached by the Pro Tours, led by former player Jack Kramer and promoter Lamar Hunt. By 1967, the amateur game was really needing uh, a boost because uh, all the great champions had been signed to professional terms. Turning professional wasn't, wasn't an easy choice because, you know, you, you, you're, in a way you're abandoning, you know, Australia to, to some degree because of Davis Cup being very important. The touring teams that started you off taking you around the world to improve your game to represent Australia. And then you're, 
you, then you're not representing anybody when you turn professional. And so it, it was a tough choice. But at the same time, I felt I, I had to do something about my future. And I thought that was, you know, a legitimate way of accomplishing it. The latest of the promoters was WCT, Lamar Hunt's organization. And he signed up the Handsome Eight. Well, as personalities, we, we were supposed to be enthusiastic and exciting and, and young and, and handsome. That was the whole idea, was, was to uh, you know, get, um, get a group of guys together that, that WCT could turn into personalities. The uh, capture of those players, who included um, John Newton, of course, and our own Roger Taylor, uh, meant that the game now desperately needed um, to resolve the question of amateurism and professionalism. Any sport in which money is being made and you're not paying the performers, but everybody else is getting money, the coaches are getting money, the, 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 the presenters are getting money, the press is getting money, everybody's getting money, the people who sell the hot dogs are getting money, everybody's getting money, but the performers, I mean, that's upside down, that's insane. The pressure reached its height when the best players in the world, players like Rod Laver and Ken Rosewall, were no longer able to play in the best championships in the world. And it finally happened as a result of the All England Club staging in 1967, on the hallowed turf of the centre court, a professional tournament. Shock horror. Wimbledon and the BBC had a trial tournament of which I, I was the promoter and brought in the eight best players, including Rod and Ken and Lou and Gonzalez and everybody, to find out if the fans would like to come to Wimbledon to see professionals. And we sold the place out all three, three days that we played, and, and that made it very easy for them to make the decision to, to go to open tennis. It's out, and that's the championship. So a very thrilling match indeed, 6-2, 6-2. 12-10, so Rod Laver becomes the first professional champion at Wimbledon. In the history of the game, nothing was as important as that decision. The first Grand Slam of this brand new era was the 1968 All England Championships. Fittingly, six years after his last, Rod Laver, the Rockhampton Rocket, won back his men's singles title. Victory in straight sets, 6-3, 6-4, 6-2, to become Wimbledon's first Open champion. The amateurs were against the pros, and there was, there was a considerable talk about the pros being overrated, and that they, you know, the, the amateurs were going to win, they are going to beat the pros, and fortunately, the, you know, we, we as the professionals did, did pretty well. With the biggest stars back in the fold, the popularity of the championships exploded but still the hallowed ground of Centre Court remained pristine. The All England Club stayed faithful to its ethos of understated elegance to the detriment of potential advertising revenue. Wimbledon is unique, uh, and, and it's, I think it's unique even amongst the four slams. Uh, if you look at commercial activity around the tournament as one example, you compare Roland Garros with Centre Court at Wimbledon, at Roland Garros, lots of sponsors' logos, and Wimbledon, no sponsorship logos. So it, it is a very unique and distinctive property, and, and the comparison that I would make uh, with Wimbledon, uh, certainly in terms of, 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 of other cultural assets, if you like, is that it's a little bit like Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle. You know? it, it, it's, it's quintessentially English, it's very distinctive, it, it, it really uh, screams out Englishness, and, and that's very, very different, obviously, to other tennis tournaments and other sporting events in, in, in this kind of globalised globalized environment that, that sport now operates. I think it's been a, a particularly a, a business um, philosophy of Wimbledon to differentiate itself from other, other uh, organisations and other sporting events and to make itself very individual. And I think by, by not advertising on, on centre court and around the grounds, that does make Wimbledon quite unique in the world of sport today. And I think if we did uh, have a lot of perimeter advertising, the danger is we would just have levelled ourselves to compete with other events and not have differentiated ourselves in that way. The approach the All England Club has always taken is to have selected partners rather than sponsors, each of whom provides goods and services required for the event. Their minimal, almost subliminal presence on centre court has raised these particular brands to iconic status. 
1978, Rolex in his history decided to be more part of the sporting world and uh, the elegance and the exclusivity of the, uh, this Wimbledon Championship was really part of the heart of Rolex at that time and still is. So it's a major thing for us. Slazenger were immensely proud of our a long-standing associationship with the championships at Wimbledon. Uh, believe it or not, we've been uh, an official ball supplier to the championships since 1902. That makes us um, in the partnership the longest standing in, in sports history. Well, Robinson's lemon barley water was indeed created at Wimbledon and the story, I'm pretty certain is true, is that there was a Robinson sales representative at Wimbledon on a particular hot and very sunny day noticed that the players were looking pretty fatigued. So he took the initiative and got together a jug with some iced water, some lemon juice, some barley powder, mixed it together and encouraged the players to drink it because it would rehydrate them and invigorate them for the next match. And so there was born Robinson's lemon barley water. It's very, very interesting because I think Wimbledon faces something of a conundrum. Um, in that, at the moment, by not having more visible logos, it is foregoing, potentially, a very strong revenue stream. But at the same time, the more it commercialises, the more, potentially, it tarnishes the, the essence of the Wimbledon brand. We, we were talking about the exclusivity, elegance, uh, uniqueness. Uh, it's really the same thing for Rolex. Uh, tradition, innovation, uh, so these, these are the roots of our association. As the 1960s gave way to the 70s, professionalism brought a new outlook to Wimbledon. It was yet another Australian who led the way in the women's game. Following in the footsteps of her male counterparts, the exceptionally athletic Margaret Court became the first Australian woman to claim the Wimbledon singles title, heralding the arrival of a new breed of female tennis player. Very fortunate that uh, one of our all-time greats, Frank Sedgman, opened his gymnasium to me and uh, uh, to work in one of his offices. He trained with me. I used to train in the gym five mornings a week and the English press used to give me a hard time. They used to call me the Aussie Amazon. Uh, but um, I always remember, I think it was my fitness that kept me in the game uh, for probably 15, 16 years without injury and it was all the training I did as a young person, and I loved it. In those days, it wasn't ladylike to say that you go into gym and work out, because um, it wasn't sort of ladylike to have muscles. Court and Goolagong, later Mrs Corley, were two of a triumvirate of precociously talented women who played out an intense rivalry that spanned 15 years. Margaret set the bar physically, Yvonne possessed bewitching balletic grace, but a diminutive American with a big personality brought mental toughness with a touch of gamesmanship to the centre court. Oh, I remember, you know, the first uh, few times that I played Billie Jean, she scared me <laughs> because she was almost, always, um, you know, she was always talking and sort of, she seemed bigger than life to me. And she was an aggressive player, serve and volley player, and I thought, oh, God, here she comes. So I used to spend more time watching her than paying attention to what I was doing. Even though I had a lot of tough matches against Margaret, I think Billie Jean was um, the one that gave me a really tougher time. Well, I think uh, Billie knew uh, tactically how to, to do it too, and I think I was one that I could uh, turn off to her when she started to perform and I think a lot of the young players didn't understand that and she would get through them uh, in the, the tactic side of it also. Uh, but she knew, I, I knew, she never moved me. I think that sort of uh, helped me tremendously and got through her a little bit. Yvonne and I had played many times. The only time I ever lost to Yvonne was in the Wimbledon tournament. Uh, I'd played her many, many times. Uh, I think it was the year when I found that I was on centre court and I was three months pregnant. I came along when Billie Jean and Margaret were on top and playing each other in all the finals. Um, so, you know, I had those two to contend with. And then along came Chris and then Martina. So I think I've, I've, it's been great that knowing that I've sort of played sort of both generations and, um, you know, did reasonably well against both. 
Knowing that I got to play against the best of the best is always going to be a great feeling. What's really important to us, too, is that we really help forge the future of women's tennis. I think every generation's job is to make the next generation better. Between the three of them, Court, Corley and King won 11 titles, and Billie Jean would go on to set records on the court and become a tireless campaigner for equality off it. As the 1970s drew to a close, a new generation of professionals had emerged, fitter, stronger and more powerful than their predecessors. Echoing the promoter's mission of the 1960s, the new breed of tennis players were more than just athletes, they were personalities. The ice cool. The brattish. The controversial. And the heartthrobs. Tennis and Wimbledon braced itself for the most exciting era the game had ever seen.